uh, over the last, I, I think over the last four or five years, he's been very, very closely involved with um, the setting up, uh, with, with Yale University in developing innovative curriculum and learning, especially in, in the, the area of liberal arts, and has been um, very closely involved with the development of the Yale NUS collaborative partnership and the new, uh, the, the, the new um, sort of curriculum there, as well as the new sort of Yale NUS partnership uh, for uh, liberal arts undergraduate education uh, in Singapore. Um, he, um, he's, he's been at, he's, he's visited through and been at IHS before as part of a joint conference that we all organized with, uh, the, the, uh, with the Claremont Colleges and uh, the Raman Research Institute as well as, it, which, you know, IHS was partnering on understanding the future of liberal arts education, um, in India. Um, and he's going to speak to us today about, um, astronomy and the world. So over to you, Brian. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, thanks, everyone, for coming out. I'm uh, delighted to be back here uh, to IHS, where they were so gracious uh, hosting our conference uh, last <clears throat> year ago, January. And uh, it's just wonderful to be back. And yeah, come on in. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit of everything. So it's something like the Douglas Adams, you know, uh, the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. And unlike Douglas Adams, it's not a single number. I've got an hour of material here for you guys. Uh, it's loosely based on first an email to Aramar Ravi, where he said, yeah, we want to hear about astronomy. We want to hear about the origins of the Earth, the origins of the universe, how astronomy and people connect. And I think here at the IHS, it's important to talk about that interface between people science, technology, and I think it's uh, kind of fun to, to bring this talk here. Uh, the talk is sort of based on my book, uh, which is called Power of Stars, Shameless Promotion, available on Amazon for $26, wonderful read. Uh, it's kind of a survey of uh, all the different ways that human beings around the world celebrate the sky, and it's based on my archaeoastronomy and world cosmology class that I've been teaching at Pomona for a long time. Pomona College is my kind of home where I started out teaching. Uh, this year, I'm out at the uh, Yale and U.S. College in Singapore, which is a brand new institution, two years old, uh, actually older than some of the new institutions here in India, which I've been talking with, and, and some of them uh, right here in Bangalore, the Azam Premji University, to open up its undergraduate program next year. Very exciting. And then some others up in New Delhi. So I'll just get started, and uh, I'm also looking forward to your questions, too, at the end. So we'll have a little bit of a free-ranging discussion at the end, I hope. Uh, one of the ways when people think about the sky, there's a lot of uh, pictures that come to mind. And the sky can be organized in these sort of constellation maps. Uh, this one in particular is showing uh, both the Earth and the sky, the Earth uh, being kind of this innermost sphere and the sky being the celestial sphere outwards. Uh, one of the things I like to point out is that while this is one particular map of the sky, different cultures from different times have different takes on all of this. So, for example, if you look just at the North Celestial Pole, and we can zoom up here on this familiar constellation of Ursa Major, uh, this particular grouping has been seen by a lot of different people throughout the ages. And in the Big Dipper are the stars that have names from the Arabic astronomers from over a thousand years ago. And within those names too are, are the constellation and the Greek letters based on star catalogs that are even earlier. And of course, all different cultures have looked at these same stars and seen different things. Uh, for the Chinese, for example, they were the home of several of the different technical uh, instruments used by the Chinese astronomical bureaus. <clears throat> and India as well as China had professional astronomers some thousand years before uh, Western Europe got its act together. <clears throat> and so the Chinese astronomers uh, would give technical names to each of these stars in the Big Dipper. They were also associated with different ministers from the Chinese uh, government, some of the, the emperor. And so in particular, the uh, Ursa Major stars were home to those different stars that were uh, related to academics. So again, kind of with our liberal arts in India or in Asia theme, uh, these were the places where uh, Minister of Literary Affairs, the god of literature and writing, 
and then the student welfare and recruiting talented young people minister. Uh, these were the places you'd go to if your child was trying to get into university, you'd appeal to these particular stars. Uh, again, that's also a topic popular in India. Uh, I did notice that these particular stars are also associated in Indian uh, mythology with the seven rishis. These are wise figures from different epochs of the past. And so there are many different ways of looking at these same stars. Uh, farther south, the Hawaiian people would look at the whole range of stars around the Big Dipper and particularly keeping track of each of them throughout the seasons as they were navigating across thousands of miles of open ocean. And so for them, uh, the Big Dipper was sort of lost in this network of stars that they all memorized from very young ages. And then in my little book, I have maps of how different people from around North America looked at the stars in this region. So for the uh, maps, if you can lo locate this area up here, this is the Big Dipper region. And so I have a whole bunch of different cultures looking at these same stars. The Inuit seeing a giant caribou in the sky, the Chumash tribe, which is sort of near my native Southern California, seeing the boys who turned into geese, um, the Chinese, uh, not particularly recognizing this constellation in this map, but uh, seeing in the sky this whole network of lunar mansions, which is also popular in the Indian culture in the form of the Naksatras, the places that the moon appears in its sidereal orbit. Um, also, I noticed uh, in a talk that uh, Mangan Vahia made uh, that within the Ursa Major constellation is referenced um, to the way in which the Ursa Major interacts with these lunar mansions. And he points out that uh, there is some uh, literature from India that says that Ursa Major visits different lunar mansions. And in his interpretation, that would be um, a sign of celestial precession. That is, the, because of the way the sky moves over thousands of years, which Indian astronomers were aware of, also Chinese astronomers, a line connecting the North Celestial Pole and the edge of the Big Dipper would point out each of the lunar mansions over a cycle of several centuries. Also in, within Indian constellation mythology, uh, Shiva is often seen in the constellation Orion, which is and, uh, one of the most important constellations for a lot of different cultures. So I just thought I'd add that since I'm here. Uh, also, if we go south, uh, if we look in the southern hemisphere, one of the most recognizable constellations are these Southern Cross and Alpha and Beta Centauri stars in here. And those have also surfaced in a lot of different cultures. The interesting thing about the southern sky is you have not only the bright stars of the southern Milky Way, but the dark clouds that surround them, the coal sack and some of the Scorpius clouds. And these for the Inca culture were seen as just important as the stars. They could see constellations of dark clouds, which oftentimes had bright stars embedded in them. So for them, Instead of seeing a great bear and a little bear like northern astronomers, they saw a great llama and a baby llama in the cloud shapes of the Milky Way. So there's just a few examples of how people around the world saw the same stars. Now, I thought because we're at the Indian Institute for Human Settlements, it's very important to talk about structures and cities and how they're aligned. So this is a big part of astronomy as practiced by ancient people, by people even today. So let's have a look at that. Uh, if you're doing an alignment of a city, a temple, of, of any kind of celestial um, orientations, you'll be using this basic set of cardinal directions, which for a lot of ancient people were as or more important than the traditional cardinal directions, north, south, east, west. These are the directions for where the sun appears farthest south, the winter solstice sunrise horizon position, the east-west line that marks the equinox, and then the northern solstice positions. And these, of course, vary by latitude, but they're very important for ancient people in marking the celestial motions of the sun and also the calendar. And within those lines, you can see a range of other positions on the horizon where the moon will appear. These are the lunar standstill points. And so a lot of ancient people kept track of those as well as part of their eclipse prediction. So you can see on a horizon a map of where the sun and moon appear, and these can serve as a reference point for aligning buildings, structures, and yes, human settlements. 
Uh, so in the case of Native American, you can use the calendar of positions of the sun, and each one of these points for, say, the Hopi had a name tied into their festival cycle. So instead of calling this a, a peak related to some uh, place name, they were actually the time for harvesting, time for celebrating the spring, that sort of thing. Uh, also within uh, North America, there are a lot of these solstice watching sites. And so this is one in Southern California where I'm from, which you can use to see the winter solstice. And during the winter solstice, a beam of light cuts through this uh, little crack in the top of the cave and lights up within in the cave this little sun figure here. So they used that about a thousand years ago for marking the extreme point of the sun. And these are uh, some of the rock art inside there. This is a sun figure, it's a shaman figure, and there's also representations of the Milky Way in there. Uh, one of the other landmarks that you can mark in the sky are uh, the equinox points and some of the other points of the solstice and uh, as we'll see, the position of the lunar line of nodes. And different cultures at different times were aware of these. Our usual way of looking at this is in terms of the celestial sphere, which has on the equator here, the celestial equator, the intersection of the sun's path and the equator, which mark the equinoxes. And those points in the sky are particularly important for ancient people. When the sun gets into this location, you have a lot of different festivals, a lot of different holidays being set ancient calendars often starting at this point in the spring. Um, you can see in the time of equinox for different years here, we're over here in 2015, there are a particular moment, minute and second, when the sun crosses that equator, which sets the equinox. And different people had uh, different ways of observing that. Uh, you can use the fact that the solar year is uh, very exact number of decimal points here to calculate these times. And different astronomers from, say, the Middle East were, were able to use that. You can also observe on the horizon when this happens by watching sunrise and sunset. So people in the tropics were able to see as the sun reaches equinox, whoops, uh, this line that connects to the zenith. On the equator, the sun is directly overhead on this day. This is something I'm very aware of in Singapore because it gets very hot during that period. Uh, more northerly, a more northern latitude, the sun appears due east and west also in the equinox, but rises to a lower height. And for those in the Arctic regions, this is the time when you go from night to day. So you have 24 hours of darkness giving way to 24 hours of light. Uh, lots of holidays starting at this point when the sun crosses that equinox. Uh, certainly holy is one that's very important. And this is used uh, to mark the end of winter with the lunar month uh, that falls uh, just before the equinox. Uh, also within the Persian culture is Nowruz, the new year, which begins exactly at the moment when the sun crosses the celestial equator. And so this one I especially like because it's a calendar that is not contingent on any sort of intercalary months. It's exactly at a particular day and time, so you can know exactly when to celebrate just by looking at your watch. Uh, nice, precise holiday. But lots of cultures celebrating the passage of the sun through this invisible landmark in the sky. So let's get back to um, some of these other landmarks in the sky and how celestial settlements are built from this alignment. Uh, one interesting alignment that is particularly important in India is that that comes about from what's called the line of nodes. This is the fact that the moon, when it orbits us, is inclined five degrees from the Earth and sun's plane, the ecliptic plane. And this means that when the moon crosses this plane, you have the capacity to have solar and lunar eclipses. Just had one a few weeks ago. There'll be another one in September, lunar eclipse. Uh, these are given names, uh, Rahu and Ketu, which relate to a tale back in the early universe when uh, Rahu was grabbing the elixir of immortality and uh, Vishnu actually saw him do this and cut off his head quickly, uh, but not before he already drank some of it. And so its head and body got separated, placed in the sky, the, both immortal because of this uh, elixir, and they also happen to be the time at which you have eclipses. 
Rahu and Kitu are the, the solar and lunar eclipse points. And so these are uh, marked uh, by Indian astronomers and astrologers. They're one of the luminaries. You always see them in temples. Uh, very important. And they're also the basis of eclipse prediction, because if you know where Rahu and Kitu are, this line of nodes, then you know whether or not you can have an eclipse. And it, they only happen when the Rahu and Kitu, the line of nodes, are pointing at the sun. So this particular phenomenon was known to ancient Indian astronomers. Also, some of the uh, uh, Middle Eastern astronomers and ancient Greek astronomers and with these numbers, you can use your own uh, calculator to calculate the time between eclipse seasons. It just comes down to these three numbers, which ancient people were not able to exactly measure from decimal points, but were able to measure from the timing across centuries of lunar and solar eclipses. So we know that the lunar month is 29.530589 days. And yes, Babylonian astronomers had something like four decimal points on this number based on eclipses that were separated by many centuries, dividing by an integer number of lunar months across many, many periods, gives you that level of accuracy. Um, we also know that the moon's orbit is this long, and the line of nodes moves around so that there's a time between crossings of the line of nodes that is 27.2122 days. And all you have to do to predict eclipses is reconcile those two numbers, finding least common multiples. Uh, the real thing to remember is that every 173 days we're in an eclipse season. So we just passed one in early April, entering another one in September, and that's the point at which Rahu can then devour uh, the sun if it happens to cross its path. So these are things that modern astronomers can measure with computers and exact uh, instruments such as you know, high quality cameras on telescopes but ancient people were also able to infer from many centuries of patient observation. You can also see different groups uh, noticing these lunar standstill points. It's alleged that one of the purposes of Stonehenge was to observe phenomena along the horizon. Uh, Native Americans also have these lunar standstill viewing points where you stand in the center of one of these temples. You can look out over a notch here where the moon appears at its standstill point. So some examples of famous aligned celestial structures. We can fly over here to England, have a look at the most famous of the aligned celestial structures, and that's Stonehenge. This one is popularized over many decades, actually many centuries, as a form of celestial temple. And the most obvious and important alignment is that with the summer solstice sunrise. So the main avenue of Stonehenge, which goes to the center of the site, along to the heel stone is aligned very nicely with the summer solstice. So on that day, the sun appears perched on top of the heel stone, like a little golf ball on top of a, uh, a tee. Uh, Stonehenge had a lot of other interpretations attributed to it. Uh, so this latest one of Astronomical Observatory might be along with some of those other associations with uh, either druidical circles or uh, magical places constructed by Merlin uh, these have had a lot of play in popular imagination over the centuries. But it is pretty obvious that at least the solstice alignment is accurate. Other uh, alignments across these trilithons have been alleged to be lunar standstill points. And these alignments are much more speculative and less accurate. So I think it may be the English are giving themselves a little too much credit for doing advanced astronomy back then. Uh, and recent archaeological evidence also shows that Stonehenge had many other purposes besides astronomy. It was an important site for healing rituals and a site where uh, various elites would go uh, occasionally. So if we fly over to Ireland, uh, we can see another uh, interesting structure, maybe a little less famous, but this is part of a series of settlements from about 5,000 years ago. And these are human settlements that are aligned with the winter solstice. This is New Grange, an enormous enclosure from about the same time as Stonehenge, about uh, 2500 or so uh, BC. It was begun in its construction. And this is the entrance which faces in the south along the line of a winter solstice sunrise. And it has this amazing property that when the winter sun rises, gets over the hill, it lights up this passageway 
and sends a beam of light right into the center of the temple. It's real Indiana Jones kind of stuff, very exciting. Uh, must have been a big, uh, important occasion for those people 5,000 years ago. Uh, and they would harness the power of the sun at this moment, perhaps to bring life, to bring light, to bring warmth to this very cold part of Earth. And I should mention that all of these structures are using the solstice sunrise as a way not only of marking the calendar, but, but perhaps tapping into some of that power of the sun. And that's where the title of my book kind of comes from. It's the power of the sun or the stars or the moon. Those uh, objects in the sky have a power of our imagination and to ancient people had a literal power over their daily life. We'll fly away from Ireland here and going off to the Middle East, Another famous uh, practice of ancient settlements was to take the most important structures and align them in the summer solstice sunrise. So you'll see a city grid tilted by a particular angle. And if you measure that angle and look at the latitude of the site, you'll find it's very nicely pointed toward the solstice sunrise. And that's the case here for these ziggurats all throughout uh, present day Iraq. You find these rotations that are not accidental. They are perfectly pointed uh, for the summer solstice sunrise. Um, and this applies to uh, eight or 10 different of these ziggurats. The theory there is that if you're standing on the, the edge here, you're watching the sun rise at its most powerful point, And again, sort of tapping in from that celestial power. As we fly over here to another site that has very famous aligned structures, we're going over here to Egypt. And if you look at the great pyramids of Egypt, these ones are aligned almost perfectly on an east-west axis. So you can see all the great pyramids here. They're almost exactly east-west. And someone did a very careful surveying of the site and found a certain number of arc minutes off from east-west and was able to correlate those offsets with the date of construction of the pyramids. And this is consistent with the idea that the Egyptians were aware of techniques of aligning to the celestial pole using stars but weren't aware that the celestial pole shifted from one century to the next. And so this study, which was published in the science magazine, it's in my book, um, is making the case that these guys uh, that built the temples were using stars and then could uh, track the effects of celestial precession from their uh, stellar alignment technique. Anyway, so these are the east-west orientations of the Great Pyramids of Egypt. In North America, too, the same practice, uh, the Great Kiva in uh, Chaco Canyon is aligned along an east-west axis. Uh, other temples in this uh, valley uh, have perfect north-south lines, and uh, it's really a beautiful testament to the universality of this urge to align uh, human structures to these celestial directions. Uh, one other place that I thought would be fun to look at is if we fly into uh, northern Arizona in the southwest, uh, one of uh, the alumni of the college that I work at, Mona College, uh, decided it would be a good idea to take a volcano and turn it into a celestial structure. And this is the artist uh, James Turrell, who's famous for a lot of installations. And this one maybe is less known because he's been working on it for 20 years and keeps it kind of enveloped in a bit of secrecy. But this is what is called the Rodin Crater. Yes, he did actually get possession of a giant volcano and converted it into a celestial structure. Uh, he was able to drill big tunnels into it and into the side, and these point to directions in the sky that allow him to view the sky in perfect uh, alignment. So one is pointing to the north celestial pole, and one is pointed straight up. Uh, these are close-ups of these little oculi. He's very into framing the sky and his installations all over the world that allow you to stand inside the center of one of these things and see the sky kind of shape, uh, framed in a beautiful geometric shape, sometimes uh, bathed in light from his uh, uh, art and psychology background. He's able to get just the right color and intensity. So that's another way of making a celestial structure. A little labor intensive though, I have to say. Uh, I should point out too that uh, at the little college uh, in California where I came from, this is one of Terrell's installation called Sky Space, and it also creates a frame for the sky and is also aligned along an east-west axis. 
Okay, but again, we're the Institute for Human Settlements here. So one thing I thought is also relevant to you guys is I look at cities and I considered the archaeoastronomy of cities because we've talked a lot about ancient structures. But what will future people think about our cities? Were they celestial temples? Were they aligned to tap into powers of stars? So I took a, a sample of cities to try to see if there were celestial alignments. And when you look at cities, you can see that many of them conform to the terrain in sort of an organic, organic way, almost like uh, roots on a tree or veins in a, in a life form. They're sort of wrapping around contours of rivers or hills. And so many of the cities in India uh, have that property, Mumbai, for example, uh, and Istanbul. This is my native home, Los Angeles, which, like true to its form, can't really be defined in a single sentence. <laughs> it has parts that are all over the place and other parts that are snapped to a regular grid. The other category of cities are like these ones, where, again, a, a future archaeoastronomer or anthropologist will look at these cities and say, yes, these are clearly celestially aligned cities. And so uh, in this case, uh, Chicago was aligned because it had to be rebuilt after fire. Uh, Buenos Aires has a wonderful north-south line. Beijing, we know, is aligned along the principles of their astronomical bureaus, which placed the northern part of the sky as the home of ministers and the emperor. So this is the imperial city. The emperor would live up here in the north part, and it was aligned along a perfect north-south axis which the rest of the city adopted. Um, San Francisco has a nice grid as also, again, as a result of a massive accident that caused them to rebuild. We know that now, but a future person may not. Uh, the other two that I thought were kind of interesting are Las Vegas, which you can imagine the fun that a future anthropologist would have with the settlement of Las Vegas. It has a celestial grid, it has large temples, it has pyramid complexes, it has all manner of interesting kind of uh, uh, sacred architecture. It's clearly uh, the home of some very important ritual. And so this would clearly be the spiritual center of at least the US. Uh, New York too, if you interpret this from an archaeoastronomy archeo standpoint, it has a tilted alignment, which interestingly coincides with the winter solstice sunrise. So clearly the architects of New York were creating this celestial aligned city so that they could view the sunrise across the avenues. And this is sometimes called Manhattan Henge. It's the effect of just what appears to be an accidental rotation of Manhattan and its street pattern to coincide with the solstice direction on the horizon. Uh, I tried this with another city, San Francisco, which didn't work very well, but if you really push all of the different landmarks, you can imagine uh, torturous things where you take like the Bay Bridge and put it over here to your Delhi Square and you, maybe you'll get a solstice alignment, but I think that still uh, needs a little bit of work. Uh, one other thing I noticed too, I was out here in India for a trip with my Yale News College that was entitled The Cosmology and Culture of the Chola Empire. And so with an anthropologist named Barney Bate, we were tromping around Southern India and our mission was to explain to our students the mix of astronomy and anthropology that exists in Tamil Nadu, and in particular how the Chola were able to, in their temples, embody their cosmology. It was a really amazing trip, and uh, I'm going to be adding a section to my new edition of the book. In doing this, I was looking at satellite imagery of some of the major temples, and one interesting thing comes out with Indian temple alignments. For the most part, they're aligned on an east-west axis. So probably 60 to 70% of temples are east-west aligned. And you can actually go through Google Earth and check this if you like. I have a website that has all this. But there's a number of them that are just tilted. And these temples were like the center of their empire. These were built very intentionally, very carefully over a lifespan as the sort of ultimate monument of that emperor or that ruler. And so I thought, well, why 19.5 degrees? Is it just random? And of course, uh, my thought is that it's not random. So I started sifting through the various possibilities. Turns out, if you precess back to the time of the Chola, some 800 to 900 AD, and if you look at where the sky was aligned, the constellation of the Pleiades, known as Kritika, as uh, Naksatra, is actually on the horizon at this location 
uh, 19.5 degrees away from east-west. So one idea I had about this is that these ones that are tilted a little bit are used to uh, look at the rise of, of Critica, the Pleiades. And this major axis then here is uh, set up in that way. And this would also be um, sensible since, uh, as I understand it, this is uh, the, the constellation that also started the new year at that time. Here's a more typical alignment along east-west for one of these temples. So a lot of them are just dead perfect east-west. I also have a section in the book called the Archaeoastronomy of Skyscrapers. And if you look at the top 10 skyscrapers in the world, they have various numerological or celestial elements to them. So for example, the Taipei 101 has eight sections, which is a very important, auspicious number. Uh, it's aligned with cardinal directions. In Shanghai, there are these towers, uh, one of which has something called the moon gate, which is this square opening up here. And this is also aligned roughly with the lunar standstill direction. So this is to say that even today in the 21st century, modern people are using this alignment technique and, and are aware of the importance of these sorts of alignments of their settlements. Okay, the other bit that I want to talk about is the universe. Because remember, it's life, the universe, and everything. So life, life being how we look at stars and align our settlements. The universe, how we think of all of that space around us. So this is a little bit of a, a crash course of different uh, models of the universe. So you start out with a very basic conception in the early days of our species. Uh, the universe can be described as a giant goddess. And someone might ask the question, who holds up the goddess? Okay, so the sky goddess here, Nut, of course, held up by the air god, Shu. Uh, and then some other smart person will say, okay, what does he stand on? Well, he's standing on the earth god, Geb. So, and then it's kind of like uh, some of those jokes that, you know, end with its turtles all the way down with one punchline of this sort. Uh, they actually didn't provide anything about where Geb is resting, but um, for ancient people, this kind of personalized universe worked just fine. Within ancient Egypt, are we having a power out Okay, cool. And this too is a, a moment, teachable moment here. We are now, for an instant, plunged into the darkness that our ancestors enjoyed every night and without the whirring sounds, without the artificial light. That too is something we should point to as, as a really critical thing about ancient cultures, which hopefully our future culture can preserve. Anyway, uh, within Egypt, there was also kind of a schematic cosmology that was a little more advanced that had a, a earthly river, the Nile, mirrored by a celestial river and cardinal directions being holding up the sky instead of a goddess. Uh, this I've visualized here with an amazing 3D graphic program showing the celestial sky river there, which is also uh, shown in Egyptian temples. If you look at the ceiling of this one. This is the temple of Seti I from 1700 BC, and it has a celestial river here, and all the various sky gods here are arrayed on either side, and as they float across the celestial river, that's how they describe the motions of planets and stars in the sky. Uh, other cultures had models of the universe that were more sort of disk-based, so the earth was a disk floating on water, various levels of the sky were ruled by different sky gods, and this, for example, is the one from the uh, Babylonian culture where uh, the chief sky god, uh, Marduk here, is ruling above everything uh, in, this, in the layer uh, made of jasper. Uh, Native Americans throughout uh, North America had the earthly layer resting on a lower world, sometimes with a sky world above. This sort of three layer sandwich structure is very popular as a model of the universe. Uh, one of my students in Singapore is from Mongolia, and I learned that his culture also in Mongolia believes in this sort of three-layered structure. Uh, this allows us to live in the middle and be periodically visited by creatures from below and have sky creatures above us. In the Southern California example here, this is from the Chumash, the earth is also resting on the backs of snakes, and when they wriggle about, the earth shakes. So they have built into their cosmology earthquakes. Uh, the Navajo people use directional symmetry as a principal element with four peaks marking the corners, uh, colors associated with each direction, and gods with each direction as well. Um, 
various uh, cultures from Mesoamerica, like the Maya, believed also in layered underworlds and built their temples to have the same number of layers as their underworld. So these are just a diff few different ways of organizing the universe. The Norse had in their world a giant uh, world tree kind of connecting lower worlds with upper worlds. The Earth, as you know from Hobbit and other popular culture, this is the middle world here. And above Asgard, down below all these different uh, fiery worlds, including one called Hell, uh, a place where the uh, various dishonored dead would go. And uh, there are also ice demons and other creatures that would be inhabiting these lower worlds. Uh, the Chinese cosmology had, in its early days, this fellow here, Pan Ku, who was thought to break open a primordial egg. And from that, uh, arose and carved all the mountains and chiseled with a giant hammer the structures on Earth, eventually dying and returning his body to become uh, the Earth. Uh, this model was replaced by more uh, technical ones. This is a Chinese model from around 200 BC that posited that the Earth was actually round, embedded in a nearly infinite space, and it moved about uh, as it was blown by uh, some kind of cosmic winds. Uh, this is sometimes called the infinite empty space model. And it was uh, popular for a while in certain circles, but replaced by a much more sensible model that got rid of the infinite empty space and put the Earth where it belongs, sensibly in a rooted square pedestal uh, surrounded by a dome, which was measured precisely by the Chinese astronomers. This is uh, the heavenly canopy model, which was the official Chinese cosmology for much of the em empire. There were also speculations that the Earth could have been floating in a spherical arrangement, but this one has felt to be more sensible because everyone knew that the Earth did not float, it was rooted, it was solid. So these are some of the different models from uh, China. Of course, you all know probably these uh, geocentric models with the Earth in the middle, spheres about them. These also arose from a process of evolution. Even within the Greek culture, there were competing ideas of primordial elements being fire. So the Earth would be surrounded by hoops of fire. This was refined with a cap that covered the Earth and little holes in the cap, providing the light of stars, sun, and moon. That, in turn, was revised with a set of primordial elements, including earth, water, air, and fire, with outside of that realm, the ether. And that got refined by other later Greek astronomers to include that whole machinery, cosmic machinery of epicycles that allowed each of these spheres to be held by an elaborate machinery that caused them to move in retrograde loops and other things, only using circular motions. So that was the prevailing cosmology in Europe for about 2,000 years, it makes its way into medieval maps. This is a map of the world that's kind of medieval T-shape. And you can also see in these maps <clears throat> those primordial elements where you have earth, water, air, and then fire. There's a fiery realm out here surrounding the earth. Uh, this is all contained neatly in the sublunary realm. This is the moon here. And this is the region at which everything changes. Outside of this area is the unchanging celestial realm. And that separation between Earth and the celestial realm was very important for European and Greek astronomers, not so important for a lot of the Asian cosmologies. Okay, so now we're going to shift into the modern astrophysics picture, and then I'll have some questions. So I thought it'd be good to just have a crash course in modern scientific cosmology. And I'm sure you have lots of great questions, so I'll just run through this. You're probably aware of this picture. This is a picture that would have been astounding to an ancient person, we take it for granted. We look at it and say, oh yeah, there's the Earth up there floating in black space. Uh, that's a profound luxury to be a modern person, to be able to view the Earth from space, to know exactly what our world looks like. This was completely impossible to ancient people. It only came about because of very patient and hard work over centuries by guys like this, Kepler, uh, with his model of nested platonic solids, which he threw out in favor of elliptical orbits around the sun. Galileo, with his patient development of telescopes, its application, his writings that explained retrograde loops in terms of a solar or heliocentric model. And of course, our friend uh, Newton, who set up the whole kind of cosmic machinery that replaced those clockwork epicycle circular motions with instead simple laws of gravitation. Newton also started that whole telescopic revolution, which started with his little reflecting telescope 
and expanded into larger uh, refracting telescopes like this one and some that were made by Herschel later on that allowed us to scan across the sky and map thousands of stars and get uh, systematic catalogs of nebulae, uh, comets, other things. This is one of Herschel's telescopes that he built. With Herschel comes <clears throat> one of the many shifts in perspective, and that, I guess, is the story of modern astrophysics. It's the universe is telling us we're not all that special again and again and again. So it starts out by moving the Earth to become a planet. But then with these kinds of surveys, we realize that the sun is just one of millions of stars. And then eventually also we go to the point where we realize our galaxy that we're embedded in is just one of billions of galaxies. And this guy here, uh, George Ellery Hale, was instrumental in making that possible through his creation three times in a row of the world's largest telescopes. He started out building this one. This is the Yerkes Telescope in Chicago. It still is the world's largest refracting telescope. No one's been able to beat this one with its 40-inch diameter lens. Uh, here he is. Um, <laughs> here it is. This is uh, the, the telescope uh, with the staff of Yerkes Observatory and then a tourist who visited the site. Uh, many tourists go to the site. I gave them tours when I was a graduate student. This guy here, a uh, little more famous than most Albert Einstein visited. And you'll see in these pictures, Albert Einstein has a fondness for world's largest telescopes. Uh, this one was built soon afterwards, Mount Wilson. Hale moved all the way to California, built the Mount Wilson Observatory, early part of the 20th century, around 1905. And then soon afterwards, the uh, larger telescopes, like this one here, the Hale 200-inch telescope was designed and then built after Hale's death. With these telescopes, it's possible to also realize that unlike real estate, of which they do not make any more of, uh, <clears throat> the universe is always making more of itself. It's expanding into uh, larger and larger volumes. And this is Hubble's initial plot of this back in 1926, where he was able to measure from the Hale telescopes all these distances to galaxies, and then correlating that with the Doppler shift. And that was the first ever evidence of the expanding universe. That, of course, brought another tourist to the site. There he is again, uh, showing, um, seeing for himself the uh, expanding universe that Einstein had predicted early on in his relativity theory and then stopped using a cosmological constant that held the universe in place. Because just like the Chinese, Albert Einstein knew the universe couldn't possibly be expanding. It had to be static. And so he added the cosmological constant to prevent what uh, Edwin Hubble here was able to observe. Uh, now we routinely also enjoy the benefits of Hubble's telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope. And they give us pictures of galaxies that are just astounding in their clarity. Uh, also, it's part of this revolution that started way back with Herschel and has continued on through the 20th century and now into the 21st century. And you can see this growth here of telescope diameter, which soon will be uh, providing us with amazing views through these large telescopes, the giant Magellan telescope and the very cleverly named 30 meter telescope, which uh, India is actually part of. The Indian Institute, uh, IUCA, is a partner in building this uh, TMT with uh, Caltech. Anyway, so this progression allows us to see farther, it allows us to understand our origins, where we came from, and that gets back to the life, uh, the universe and everything. We ourselves arise from this universe. As my hero Carl Sagan says, yes, we are star stuff. We arise from the early universe. And now with these telescopes, we can actually literally look back in time and see the early universe. So uh, one example that I'll tell you about from my research is looking at uh, clouds of gas and dust, which ordinarily are not usually the most charismatic component of the universe. Gas and dust sort of floats around. It's not very bright. But within that gas and dust contain all the elements that eventually form planets and stars and us. So inside a uh, cloud are those first elements beyond helium. These clouds are formed from other stars that have died. And you can use telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope and the Keck Telescope to look at a very distant bright star, or quasar. And in our case, we're using quasars. And as the light travels through intergalactic space, the space expands, the light gets redder and redder. Uh, at each point when it hits one of these clouds, the cloud leaves a little imprint of itself 
on the spectrum. And you can actually see in these different clouds a history of the universe's element production, a climate record, if you will, of the early universe. This is the kind of spectrum you can get with the Keck telescope, and it shows you a line here in emission. This is a big spike from hydrogen in the early universe. It started out in the ultraviolet, but because of cosmic expansion, shifted into optical light. And these are all little clouds of hydrogen that are in front of the quasar. And there are little, literally thousands of these little clouds stretched out between the quasar and us over the space of tens of billions of light years. And we can measure in each of these little clouds little puffs of the first oxygen, first carbon, those first elements that eventually become us are imprinted into this light, which itself is some 12 billion years old. It's an amazing thing. It's like getting a, a cosmic climate history, an ice core, if you will, from the early universe, or tree rings in the early universe, all contained in this little sample of, of ancient light. So in my research, I look at quasar absorption lines. They, again, contain within them imprints of all these little clouds. This is an animation showing all these little clouds as the light travels through the universe. It leaves this little bite in the spectrum. And occasionally, it hits a big galaxy. And that leaves a larger bite in the spectrum. So what I do is I study these little galaxies that are in front of quasar. And I can use the light of the galaxy, which may have already died by now. It, it, we're looking back in time 8 billion years in the past. But we can see in this hydrogen and carbon and silicon and iron, all of those first elements in the periodic table, and study how those elements accumulate over billions of years. So in my research, I've been looking at what we call damp climate alpha systems, comparing this hydrogen with some of these lines of carbon and oxygen. Again, the oxygen that we're breathing came out of the early universe, was released into a cloud by some supernova explosion, and these little bits of oxygen are similarly ancient. Uh, here's a spectrum which shows some very primordial oxygen and carbon. And we're studying uh, whole ensembles of these quasars and finding some that have one one thousandth of the carbon element. This is a logarithmic scale showing uh, one one thousandth of the carbon abundance and trying to see within these very pristine early universe samples what other elements exist. And using that as a way of studying how the first stars that died and gave their lives for us, becoming star stuff, uh, what kind of pattern of element abundances they left. So that's, that's what I like to do for my astrophysics research. I should also mention that one of the other shifts that we're having to deal with as modern people is not only is our planet all that much, not only is our star just one of hundreds of billions, and not only is our galaxy one of hundreds of billions of galaxies, but all of the matter that we're made out of, all the galaxies are made out of, are a tiny contaminant of the real majority of stuff. That is baryons, the stuff that we're made out of, is a tiny contaminant, about 4% of the universe by mass. And the real action in the universe is in the form of dark matter. Dark matter outweighs us by a factor of five or six. It can be seen in this image in the form of these blue clouds that are crashing together as these two galaxy clusters are passing through each other. And the red cloud here is the shocked um, hydrogen gas that results from the ordinary baryonic matter whereas the dark matter just passes through uh, the collision unscathed. Uh, dark matter can be measured, it can be counted using the Hubble Space Telescope, and uh, even maps of dark matter over uh, expanses of billions of light years have been con constructed. This is one showing big blobs of dark matter that seem to fill most of the space between us and distant galaxies. I should also point out that this blob of dark matter, which extends about 4 billion light years, is about the largest structure that we can see. It's found by a technique called uh, microlensing. And my former student uh, was one of the authors of this little paper that I'm kind of proud of. Um, also within the dark matter, though, is uh, a mixture of dark matter and this new component that is uh, called dark energy, for lack of a better name which seems to outweigh the dark matter by a factor of three. And of course, as you probably know, supernova studies have shown that the universe is racing apart even faster than from Einstein's Big Bang calculation, that it has within it 
some source of acceleration, which we're for now calling vacuum energy or dark energy. And time after time, when astronomers try to get rid of this effect, they can't. So from supernova studies, from cosmic microwave background studies, from studies of ancient star clusters, all of them are giving us this very clear signal that some 70% of the universe is made of this mysterious dark energy. So now we're at an interesting point in our history where we realize that we are this tiny contaminant on the universe, and 96% of the universe is made of something we have no idea what it is. So in a way, we've kind of gone right back to our ancient origins, not really knowing what most of the universe is made out of, and we have given them scientific sounding names, but we really have no idea what either one is. That's us. So that's the universe. We can go through its history, starting out with the Big Bang, an inflationary epoch, the gradual cooling trend in the universe that gives rise to the first particles, neutrons and protons, and eventually nuclei in the first few minutes. Those eventually cooling and condensing in the form of the first atoms in the first 300,000 years. And then over the course of maybe about a billion years, the first stars and galaxies begin to form and arrange themselves into galaxies. We know all this stuff. So while we don't know what most of the universe is really made of, we've been able to very exquisitely uh, piece together the very early history of the universe from a combination of astrophysics, astronomy, and particle physics. So it's pretty amazing, really, that our species has come this far from thinking of the sky as a sky goddess held up by an air god to a point where we can measure very exactly the times at which the universe becomes opaque, first galaxies form, and the uh, galaxies evolve, and eventually our little solar system forms. So that's us sitting here at the point of this giant light cone that extends outwards and back in time. I guess the last thing I want to just mention before I wrap up is all of this science, all this technology, all this astronomy has not only allowed us to see the Earth from space, but also to flip that and look from our Earth to the very edges of space. So this, of course, as you might know, is the uh, Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Uh, sitting as it is right below this Shiva constellation here is a blank patch of sky. And in that black patch of sky, not too far from what the ancient Indians thought was ignorance that Shiva was trampling, uh, this is the region of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. So if we could just get the lights a little bit, I want to take us out to the edge of the universe here. Let's get the lights a little bit, do we? Because it has to be seen in complete darkness. OK, good enough. So again, this is Orion up here. And the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, just like the Hubble Deep Field before it, was chosen in a part of sky that had really nothing at all significant in it. So as we peel away these layers of ordinary stars, which are mostly in our own galaxy, those part, it's almost like we're flying out into space and then we begin to see the visible galaxies beyond our own. These little dots here all are external galaxies at uh, various distances. As we move closer into the image, we can begin to resolve a lot of these galaxies into shapes. The Hubble Space Telescope can actually see all of these little galaxies, and all of them are arrayed within a little tiny patch of sky about the size of a grain of sand held at your arm's length. Within that patch of sky are about 3,000 galaxies. And because they're at various distances, we can see them back in time. These redder ones are galaxies that are billions of years old and can watch them as they're being assembled from collapsing clouds being attracted by the laws of gravity. So this is, again, that privilege that we have as modern peoples, being able to watch the universe assemble from our little blue dot in the sky and, and being able to piece together from all of our science and astronomy the history of the universe. So that's all I've got. Uh, thanks for coming, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. You get some light stuff. And again, sorry for the shameless book plug. Any questions?
I have a comment to make. Uh, so this was a very interesting uh, the, the talk which I have given now. So I just wanted like uh, people here in IHS are uh, building new urban plans. So I think just like our ancients, considering the these uh, uh, celestial ali alignments uh, in the architecture of uh, new cities would be a very good uh, suggestion for building very nature friendly, nature connected cities. Because right now for our ancients, it was a um, necessity to locate the which month and kinds, the time of the these things. But now we are so much unconnected from nature and we have all other devices and uh, so in architecture point of view, we don't consider these things. I think uh, while building new cities, uh, we should uh, plan such that it looks beautiful by very nature of it. Yeah, so it has those cosmic symmetries built into it, yeah. Yeah. I think it would be good and I actually was hearing uh, that I guess the ancient Harappan cities were apparently aligned in a nice grid structure that allowed winds to kind of clear uh, out uh, dust the, and things. And they were not just celestially aligned, yeah. but, but optimized for uh, the climate and the sun and wind directions. So I think it would make sense to keep some of these things in mind when we lay out our cities. Yeah, if only we were able to plan <laughs> some of our cities. Uh, I have more of a personal question to ask you. Uh, from my childhood, whenever I've been studying or reading something about the origins of the universe and, you know, cosmology as an expanse of the universe, am I not loud enough? Sorry. So basically, the question that I have to ask you is, how do you, in your own life, how do you, you know, walk between these scales at one point being that tiny, 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 tiny oh, yeah. human being and then you know, being able to like look at the expansive scale and you know, be, be able to like find your own space within and I mean, yeah. it's a very, like that, this video that you showed last and that empty space and just going in and realizing that it's so much out there, probably never ever be able to capture it in any form and how do you cope with that, you know? Like, yeah, so at, at first glance that could be a, a source of despair uh, of anguish that we're so insignificant. But when you think about it a little more and kind of ponder, especially on a dark night on a mountaintop, it becomes a source of amazing peace and serenity and actually uh, pride in the human condition that little tiny human beings on this tiny, tiny insignificant rock were able to piece together all the space and time around them using just like pieces of metal and glass and, and scratching numbers on a page. It's just an astounding thing that we've done as a species in just a few life, lifespans. Uh, so I find it to be uh, uh, humbling and exalting at the same time in the, in the human, what humans can do. Uh, so humans often aren't doing their best work. <laughs> Any newspaper will tell you that. But I think in this case, you can really see it's a tribute to civilization. And I actually enjoy thinking about the distance scale, like especially if you're stuck in traffic or having a bad day, just step back and imagine flying through cosmic space. It's very relaxing. Don't do that while driving, though. I don't <laughs> recommend that. <clears throat> but it's very peaceful to think about, I think. Just me, maybe. Yeah, um, so I just want, I'm just curious to know, uh, can you tell us a little bit of the evolution of the field of archaeoastronomy as to when oh, yeah. it came up and how did it? Sure, evolve? yeah. Uh, in my case, I thought it would be a cool seminar to teach freshmen when I started out as a college professor. And that sort of started me down a path for 20 years teaching this thing. Um, I liked it because it combined human culture, history, anthropology, and science. And I found that for our science-phobic US students, it was kind of a way of teaching them science without them quite realizing they were learning science, that they were attracted by the cultural elements, the star tales and the models of the universe. But then they started to realize they had to understand a lot of technical stuff to get to it. As a field, it began probably with those British guys who uh, in a lot of cases were looking at various uh, megaliths around the British Isles and trying to uh, figure out why they were there 
And after surveying them, uh, Alexander Tom is a famous figure of this uh, story. Uh, and putting them on, on nice maps and grids, uh, various recurrent patterns seem to occur, which seem to indicate solstice alignments of a number of different stone circles within the British Isles. Later on in the sort of 1960s or so, there was a big surge of interest in Stonehenge and other places being tied into all number of uh, exotic uh, mathematical computations from early Britain. Again, I think they were giving themselves too much credit for that period, but um, that sort of sparked a global interest in uh, ancient uh, astronomy. So pretty much from the 1960s onwards, uh, and maybe also the recognition of non-Western cultures contributing to this story of astronomy, uh, there became an interest in kind of world astronomy and various sites in Europe and beyond Europe began to be surveyed. Um, various Indian sites began to be looked at. Um, so it, it's kind of a young field. It sits in a fragile place between disciplines. So a lot of people in it don't achieve all the recognition and credit that their disciplinary societies would ordinarily give to more specialized work. But I find it to be a really exciting one to teach and uh, personally very gratifying because you get to go to really interesting places like southern India, and uh, in June I'm going off to the Four Corners area on an archaeoastronomy trip looking at Pueblo uh, cultures and their solstice viewing sites. So it's just an amazing thing because it also, um, again, taps into that power of the night sky. Because you can look at the sky and you can measure it. You can be clinical, mathematical with it. But I think also ancient people were looking at it uh, as a source of kind of spiritual energy of various kinds. And I don't think it's wrong for a modern astrophysicist to similarly take that kind of emotional enjoyment from the sky, or for that matter, anyone who can see the sky in our light polluted world to be able to recognize that uh, permanence of the sky. So buildings may rise and fall around you, uh, headlines change, but the sky is always overhead, it's unchanging over your, your life. And it's also visible anywhere on Earth, and all the different people around the world have been looking at it for centuries. So that sort of continuity of it and the universality of it is very exciting, I think. Uh, uh, just a quick comment first. Uh, thank you very much. That was very, very cool, very interesting. Uh, it's, I, to me personally, it's uh, very, uh, it's liberating to know that we know so little. Uh, it's actually cool uh, to, to be sure of that. Uh, it's about the same about uh, uh, as much as we know about Indian cities, to be honest. It's 4%. <laughs> No more than that. So, uh, but yeah, but I have a, a sort of a, uh, you may, I mean, maybe a funny question, but uh, what do you think is the probability of actually making contact in, say, the next 10 years? Uh, now, our powers of observation are increasing, and, and now we know uh, we can see planets. Uh -huh. We can yeah. guess there are planets. Yeah. Uh, we've gone beyond stars now, and, and, uh, uh, I mean, finding uh, thousands of planets. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, I think uh, to me it's very exciting and and very. Uh, uh, so, what do you think? I mean, and who is working on this? Uh, you know. Yeah, that's another. That's um, okay. So, first of all, the the exoplanet area. The, they're called exoplanets these days. Extra, extrasolar planets. There are about six thousand of them in the NASA exoplanet database, and probably another three or four thousand that have yet to be confirmed. All that based on studies of maybe 150,000 stars, which are a tiny fraction of all the stars in, in our own galaxy, let alone the rest of the galaxy. And within that sample of several thousand planets appear to be maybe 20 that look like they're Earth-like. And that's good news if you want life to exist outside of Earth, because that means that we've only surveyed, you know, uh, maybe one ten millionth or so of all the stars that are out there uh, in our galaxy and found maybe a dozen that could support life. So if you multiply that by 10 million, there are going to be something like 20 to 40 million Earth-like planets out there in our galaxy alone. And so even if life is very improbable, it may be, we just don't know, uh, there should be probably thousands of life-bearing planets in our galaxy. Of those, whether any of them become intelligent, whether we become intelligent, remains to be seen. And whether they communicate in a way that we recognize also remains to be seen. And all that comes down to the Drake equation and ways of predicting the presence of extraterrestrial life. 
people have tried beaming various star systems with radio telescopes as a way of saying, hey, we're here. Uh, the Voyager interstellar record is racing off to the next star. They're the fastest spacecraft humans have ever built. It'll take over 20,000 years, though, to get to the nearest star. Uh, so we are kind of reaching out, and we're also accumulating uh, catalogs of new planetary systems. At this pace, it does seem kind of inevitable that in the next century or so, uh, humans will discover something with traces of life. Maybe the form of an atmosphere that, that has a little bit of oxygen or a little bit of methane in it. Uh, whether or not we'll see that little radio wave or otherwise uh, be able to communicate or detect intelligent life, you know, it's all speculative. I sort of think it will happen in the next century or so, but it's all speculation. Uh, hopefully they're friendly. Hopefully they're <laughs> a little smarter than us, too. Uh, we'll see. Uh, we're getting smarter ourselves, though. So that's one of the things in the Drake equation, too, that predicts the number of planets. You know, the last term is the lifespan of an intelligent civilization. No one knows that. So we have to make sure our lifespan is really long, because that will enhance the probability of us seeing other ones. Yeah. We had the power cut. Oh, yeah. Could you well, so one of the coolest things about teaching the ancient form of astronomy as opposed to the modern astronomy is you can try to recreate a little bit in the classroom setting or even better outside the classroom, like in the field, uh, something like what an ancient person would experience in looking at the sky. And that really just involves moving students out into a dark site, maybe having a fire and telling star tales. And when you do that, you realize that the ancient experience, which is in some ways hardwired into us, into our minds, it, it's a very satisfying one. Because if you've heard some of these tales told, probably in your own life experience, there are tales told. But if you're connecting it to the sky, you almost feel like you're in the presence of you know, this kind of whole cast of characters. You can point to that star, and that becomes this figure, and that star is that figure and they're all interconnected. It's a way of remembering how they all interrelate with each other. But more importantly, it's people sitting around together talking, not staring at little screens, but talking and looking up at the sky and kind of sharing that uh, experience. So I really enjoy that kind of pre-modern experience of uh, being without technology occasionally, being out under the stars. I think it's something a lot of us modern people really miss. and. Some don't even know they're missing it because they've never seen a dark sky. We took a lot of Singaporean students out to uh, Malaysia last September. And for the first time, about half of the students had never seen the Milky Way. And it was amazing for them to actually see the Milky Way for the first time. It's an incredible thing to be able to see that. And so somehow we have to get those experiences to our kids and uh, also, you know, have dark places where you can still see the skies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to hang around, too, if anyone has other questions. Uh, thank you, everyone. And if my kids are watching. Hi. I understand it's streaming all over the earth. Yeah. Cool. <laughs>